All right, if we can get the uh, recordings underway, I've got the uh, PC recording underway. Uh, recording is rolling. And four. Chief Sergeant, are you going to do the backup? Backup is good. Thank you, sir. Good morning and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Resiliency and Waterfronts. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video. To minimize disruption, please silence your electronic devices. And if you wish to submit testimony, please do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that's testimony at council nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. We are ready to begin. Thank you, Sergeant. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Councilman Justin Brannon. Thank you for joining our virtual hearing today of the Committee on Resiliency and Waterfronts. I first want to acknowledge my colleagues who have joined me so far, Councilwoman Debbie Rose, uh, Councilman Ruben Diaz Sr. And I think that's all we've got for now, but we're expecting Councilman Constantinides and others. Um, I now wanna turn it over to our committee council, Jessica Steinberg-Albin, just to go over some uh, procedural items. Thank you, Chair Brannon. I am Jessica Steinberg-Albin. Council to the Resiliency and Waterfronts Committee of the New York City Council. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify, when you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. I will be periodically announcing who the next panelists will be. The first panelist, to give testimony will be Janie Bavishi, Director of the Mayor's Office of Resiliency. I will call you when it is your turn to speak. For the question and answer period only, we will also be joined by the Mayor's Office of Resiliency and Mayor's Office of Sustainability, Deputy Director for Infrastructure and Energy, Suzanne DeRoche, and the New York City Department of Buildings, Assistant Commissioner for Technical Affairs and Code Development, Joseph Ackroyd. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of the administration or a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you. First, going by the sponsors of the bills we are hearing today, and then in the order you have used the Zoom raise hand function. We will be lim limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes to answer your questions. Thank you. I will now pass it to Chair Brannon to give an opening statement. Thank you, council. Um, I also wanna acknowledge we've been joined by my colleague, Councilman Costa Constantinides. Um, good morning, everybody. My name is Justin Brannon. I have the privilege of chairing the Committee on Resiliency and Waterfronts. I'd like to welcome you all to today's virtual hearing. Uh, we're gonna hear two bills today and two resolutions, which we're excited about. Uh, New York City faces significant threats from extreme weather events and high tides, and the city will continue to experience greater and more frequent damage because of climate-related weather events and sea level rise. Neighborhoods along the shores of Jamaica Bay, Flushing Bay, and the eastern shore of Staten Island regularly experience tidal inundation now. And this trend will only be exacerbated by continued sea level rise. New York State ranks third in the nation for the most homes at risk of coastal inundation by the end of this century. The city with 520 miles of coastline is particularly vulnerable to the impacts of sea level rise, storm surge, and high tide or what they call sunny day flooding. According to scientists for the National Center for Atmospheric Research, the city will likely experience an increase in sea level rise twice the global average. Floods 
are the most common and most damaging natural disasters in the country. But coastal flooding caused by sea level rise is just one of the climate change ha hazards affecting the city's residents and property. Heat waves and severe rainstorms are becoming more and more intense and occurring more frequently. Heat waves kill more people than any other weather disaster. And because of the urban heat island effect, the city and its residents are extremely vulnerable to extreme heat. The mayor's office of resiliency has stated that resilient design must become an integral part of the project planning process for city agencies and designers, and that all new projects and substantial improvements should assess risks to climate hazards in their design and site. The climate resiliency design guidelines by the mayor's office of resiliency is a guidance document that encourages city agencies to include forward thinking climate change data in the design of city capital projects to make them more resilient to all climate hazards. However, city agencies do not have to use these guidelines. They are advisory and not required. Today we'll hear intro 29, sorry, intro 2092 by council member Constantinides. This bill would require that the design principles and the climate resiliency design guidelines be applied to all city capital projects and that the city develop a climate resiliency score metric for capital projects. Once developed, all city capital projects would have to meet the required score for that project. We look forward to working with the administration on this important common sense bill. Floods are the most common and most damaging natural disasters in the country. And New York City has more residents living in high risk flood zones than in any other city in the United States. As climate change worsens and sea levels rise, the city's floodplain will continue to expand landward. This will lead to more flooding events and more property owners will see their properties inundated with floodwaters. Today, we'll also hear intro 2198 by council member Matteo. This bill would require that structures located within the floodplain be elevated to an, to an additional one to two feet above what is currently required by the current city building code to make sure that these structures, which are highly susceptible to floodwaters, have additional flood proofing. By adding freeboard, which is the additional safety factor above the flood line, above which finished floors and critical systems of a building are placed, such properties would be protected from flood events. And property owners would be able to lower their annual flood insurance premiums. We must also continue to protect the people and property that are adjacent to our shorelines. Large scale coastal resiliency projects are expensive. They can cost in the hundreds of millions to billions of dollars. Even before the pandemic, we did not have the resources to fund each coastal resiliency project necessary to protect the city's residents, visitors, and property. And the money we have received from the federal government to fund these coastal resiliency projects is tied to a national emergency declared in response to a national disaster. Today, we'll hear my pre-considered resolution calling on Congress to amend the Stafford Act so that the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, and the US Department of Housing and Urban Development can proactively fund coastal resiliency projects and not have to wait for a disaster to occur. Federal funds must not be tied to a severe weather event or national disaster. For, what, for every $1 the federal government spends now on disaster mitigation, $6 will be saved in the future disaster costs. How can we mitigate against future climate events if we are not forward thinking? Pursuant to the Stafford Act, the president may declare a national emergency in response to a national disaster. National emergencies were declared after Superstorm Sandy and more recently in response to the COVID pandemic. FEMA and HUD can then use disaster relief funding to help states and cities plan and construct coastal resiliency projects. But these funds are tied to disasters that have already occurred not to disasters that we know will occur in the future. The Storm Act, which was signed into law on January 1st, amends the Stafford Act to allow FEMA to, to fund a revolving loan fund that local governments can use for mitigation, for, for proactive mitigation projects. Although these funds are not tied to a disaster declaration, only $100 million has been authorized to be allocated 
for 2022 and 2023. That's $100 million to be divvied up among all states and Indian tribal governments for the next two years. The Storm Act is a step in the right direction, but clearly it's not enough. The federal government can and must do better. We also need the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to complete the New York, New Jersey Harbor and Tributary Study, or HAT study, and they have to fund coastal storm protection measures for New York City. My resolution that we'll hear today calls on Congress to fully restore funding for the HAT study, a multi-year study of different water and land-based coastal storm protection measures that was suspended back in February 2020 when the former president pulled the funding for it. The good news is that the Consolidation, Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021, which was signed into law at the end of December, requires the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to complete the HAT study and to address a sea level rise, as well as consult with communities in the affected areas along the shore. This is an excellent first step. However, studying does not equal action. And the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers can still decide to end this project after the study is complete. We must continue to call on Congress and the U.S. Army Corps to proactively address the effects of climate change, especially sea level rise, and take concrete steps to protect our vulnerable communities. I look forward today to hearing from the Mayor's Office of Resiliency. Before we begin, I of course want to thank my committee staff, Committee Counsel Jessica Steinberg-Albin, Senior Policy Analyst Patrick Mulville, Senior Finance Analyst Jonathan Seltzer, my Chief of Staff Chris McCright, and my Deputy Chief of Staff, Kayla Santosuoso, for all their hard work in putting today's hearing together. I will now turn it over to my great colleague, uh, Councilmember Constantinides, to give an opening on his bill, Intro 2092. Thank you, Chair Brian, and, and thank you for all that you're doing. And, and please add me to the pre-considered resolution as a co-sponsor. Right thank, um, thank you for the great work that you're doing. And, Definitely miss you and wish this hearing was at 2.50 or at uh, City Hall, uh, but uh, not, to be, not to be yet. Uh, you know, as a city on the sea, we're literally on the front lines of the fight to secure a livable climate. We've made great strides in making our city more sustainable, but the reality is that we must prepare for worst case scenarios. As we saw during Hurricane Sandy, much of our infrastructure is not yet prepared to deal with the worst impacts of climate change. That's why it's so critical we set resiliency standards for everything we build in New York City. Over the last few years, as you referenced, the Mayor's Office of Resiliency has put together a set of climate resiliency design guidelines for city projects to use max to, 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 for using maximum resiliency. For example, reflective surfaces, designing ventilation for extreme heat, or expanding uh, drainage systems. But these are just guidelines and not yet mandatory for city projects. And that really has to change. Climate planning must be the cornerstone of everything we do. If we have to ask if something can build resiliency with resiliency or sustainability in mind, then it has to go back to the drawing board. And that's where 2092 comes in. It requires the city to create a pilot program for climate resiliency design guidelines. I think it's fair to say that we've got a good head start on this one. And once the guidelines are complete, the city must create a metric, a scoring metric for project that sets a minimum standard for resiliency that every subsequent project must meet. And their report on the creation of Waterfront Edge Design Guidelines, or WEDGE, uh, the Waterfront Alliance notes that we have spent more than 47 billion in claims through the National Flood Insurance Program since 1978, 40% just coming in the last 10 years and we lose an average of nearly 80 acres of coastal wetlands a year due to a development and sea level rise. Criteria like wedge or the city's design guidelines cannot be stored in an option box to check anymore, but must literally and figuratively be the foundation of everything we build on from here on out. By mandating design guidelines, doing comprehensive fiber resiliency planning and creating new climate indicators, we can truly make 2021 the year of resiliency. Again, I wanna thank my brother, Chair uh, Justin Brannon for his steadfast partnership on these issues, Janie Bavishi and her whole team at MOR for getting the ball rolling on the creation of these guidelines and their great work and everyone to rise to Resilience Coalition uh, for their advocacy. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Cust. Um, I'm now going to turn it back over to our moderator, uh, the Council, Jessica Steinberg Albin. Thank you, Chair. And thank you, Council Member Constantinides. We will now call on members of the administration to testify. First, Janie Bavishi, Director of the Mayor's Office of Resiliency. For the question and answer period only, we will also be joined by Suzanne DeRoche, Deputy Director for Infrastructure and Energy from the Mayor's Office of Resiliency and Mayor's Office of Sustainability, and Joe Ackroyd, Assistant Commissioner for Technical Affairs and Code Development from the New York City Department of Buildings. Before we begin, I will administer the oath. Director Bavishi, Deputy Director DeRoche, and Assistant Commissioner Ackroyd. I will call on each of you individually for a response. Please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before these committees and to respond honestly to council member questions? Director Bavishi. Yes. Deputy Director DeRoche. Yes. Assistant Commissioner Ackroyd. Yes. Thank you. Director Bavishi, you may begin when ready. Good morning. I am Janie Bavishi, Director of the Mayor's Office of Resiliency. I would like to thank Chair Brannon and Council Members Constantinidis, Diaz, Ulrich, and Rose for the opportunity to testify today. I am pleased to join Council this morning to discuss two important bill introductions and to share context about the city's ongoing efforts to increase the short-term and long-term resiliency of buildings and infrastructure in the face of growing climate threats. It is well known that following Hurricane Sandy, the city began developing plans for large-scale coastal resiliency projects. On a parallel track, the city also began embarking on less publicized but equally vital efforts to increase the resiliency of public and private buildings, as well as the infrastructure that serves all New Yorkers. These efforts began with reforms to strengthen Appendix G of the New York City Building Code in 2014. Driven by a shared desire to make new construction safer and more resilient, the mayor's office worked with council to develop and pass a package of new standards. These standards, which remain in place today, are among the most stringent building codes anywhere in the country. In the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy, the city also adopted temporary emergency zoning rules that made it easier for New Yorkers to rebuild quickly while increasing their resilience against future flooding and giving homeowners more ways to reduce their flood insurance costs. These temporary rules were popular and effective in Sandy impacted communities and provide an excellent example of how the city can encourage private sector resiliency investments. The Department of City Planning is now in the process of updating those rules with lessons learned and making them permanent through a proposal known as Zoning for Coastal Flood Resiliency. On February 3rd, the City Planning Commission will hold a public hearing on this proposal. Following this hearing, the Council will have an opportunity to hear and vote on the proposal. As you know, flood mapping is another important component of climate adaptation planning. Like virtually every other city in the United States, New York City currently relies on FEMA's flood insurance rate maps or firms for planning purposes. However, these maps are insurance maps, and although they are currently used for building code and design, they have significant limitations, the most significant being that they only represent present day risk. This makes sense for setting flood insurance rates since premiums are determined based on the risks we face today or this year and can be recalculated on an annual basis. However, as we plan for constructing new buildings, we must consider future threats, since most buildings have a lifespan of many decades. We must consider flood risk across the entire useful life of an asset or building. To address this problem, my office is working to develop a first of its kind future flood risk map for New York City that will incorporate climate projections through 2100. We are starting the model modeling process now, and when these maps are complete, we will work with council and DOB to find out how to best integrate these maps into building code. This would result in codifying higher building elevation requirements that are extremely precise for all floodplain construction in New York City. Finally, as council is already aware, my office has developed the Climate Resiliency Design Guidelines, which provides guidance on how to incorporate forward-looking climate change data in the design and construction of city capital projects. First issued in 2017, the guidelines were developed through a collaborative process with over 20 city agencies and authorities. 
Due to the participation and feedback of agency partners over the last five years, the city is now prepared to pilot, pilot the guidelines more broadly. These guidelines now in their fourth iteration are a critical tool for incorporating resiliency across the city's $90 billion capital portfolio. By developing and coordinating a citywide methodology for integrating resilient design and public buildings and infrastructure, we can ensure that our public investments are durable, long lasting and serve critical functions for New Yorkers, despite the threats posed by extreme weather and chronic climate stresses. No other city in the country has developed such comprehensive multi-hazard design guidelines and the adoption of the guidelines by city capital agencies represents an important opportunity for New York City to continue its national leadership on climate adaptation issues. The climate resiliency design guidelines address the extreme weather threats and increasing chronic climate stresses that pose the greatest risk to city capital construction. These include hazards caused by storm surge, chronic tidal flooding, increased precipitation, and extreme heat. The guidelines are essential for protecting the city's facilities from extreme weather damage, and in doing so, will save taxpayers money and improve the city's overall fiscal health. While I am extremely proud of our work to increase the resiliency of buildings and infrastructure, there is no question that we must do more. As the past year clearly demonstrated, climate change is not letting up. Global temperatures keep rising and 2020 was the second hottest year on record. The Atlantic hurricane season is also growing more intense and more dangerous, with last year's being the most active on record. With this in mind, we look forward to working closely with Council on both bill introductions being heard today. We support the intent of Intro 2092, which would mandate a five-year pilot of the Climate Resiliency Design Guidelines for public facilities and create a resiliency scoring system for these facilities. We believe beginning with a five-year pilot is a critical first step that will allow the city to collect necessary information on real-world benefits and costs of implementing the guidelines, given the wide variety of assets in the city capital portfolio. These lessons will inform an updated version of the guidelines, the scoring system, as well as possible future design mandates. Starting with a pilot phase will manage upfront costs during the current fiscal crisis. And we look forward to designing a pilot program that reflects the realities of the city's budget constraints while producing meaningful results. We also look forward to working closely with council on intro 2198. We support the intent of this bill and commend council for seeking opportunities to continue strengthening requirements for new buildings. That being said, we wanna ensure that intro 2198 is coordinated with the extensive ongoing work I have just described. In particular, we wanna ensure any new requirements are consistent with version 4.0 of the Climate Resiliency Design Guidelines and consider the Department of Buildings upcoming code revision proposal, which will include increased freeboard requirements in, in Appendix G. Additionally, any increase in freeboard should be coordinated with our groundbreaking future flood risk map project. We are eager to provide feedback and recommendations that advance these critical tools that will make New York City stronger and more resilient. In conclusion, I would like to thank the Committee on Resiliency and Waterfronts for allowing the administration to testify here today. I look forward to your questions alongside MOR's Deputy Director for Infrastructure and Energy, Suzanne DeRoche, and our colleague, Joe Ackroyd, Assistant Commissioner for Technical Affairs and Co-Development at the Department of Buildings. Thank you, Director Bavishi. I will now turn it over to questions from Chair Brannan. For these questions, we will additionally be joined by Deputy Director for Infrastructure and Energy, Suzanne DeRoche, from the Mayor's Office of Resiliency and Office of Sustainability, and Assistant Commissioner for Technical Affairs and Code Development, Joe Ackroyd, from the New York City Department of Buildings. Panelists, please stay unmuted if possible during this question and answer period. As a reminder, if council members other than Chair Brannan would like to ask a question of the administration or a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you. First, going by the sponsors of the bills we are hearing today and then in the order you have used the Zoom raise hand function. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes to answer your questions. Thank you. Chair, ba Chair Brannan, please begin. Thank you, Council. Uh, I want to ask you a couple of questions, and then I want to give it to to the bill sponsor to to ask. Um, um, so the mayor's office of um, Hi, Janie. Good to see you. Good to see you. <laughs> um, the mayor's office of resiliency recently published, as we were saying, the version 4.0 of the resiliency design guidelines, uh, which are non-binding and discretionary. 
Um, I, I know that MOR also recognizes that heat, sea level rise, and precipitation should be considered uh, in the design and construction of, of buildings and infrastructure in the future. Um, in light of all this, do, do you feel, as the administration feel, that all city capital projects should meet a specified climate resiliency criteria? Thank you for the question, Chair Brannon. Um, so let me just take a step back and, and just make sure everyone understands exactly what the climate resiliency design guidelines are and, um, and, and how far we've come in the implementation of the guidelines so far. So as I have mentioned in my testimony, the climate resiliency design guidelines were first introduced by MOR in 2017. And they establish guidance that ensure city infrastructure and facilities are prepared to withstand the future impacts of extreme weather and the chronic impacts of climate, stress, climate change that we face, um, such as tidal flooding. Uh, so applying the guidelines across the city's entire capital program will, will ensure that all new public buildings and infrastructure are flood proofed and equipped to manage extreme heat waves. Um, and this will strengthen our buildings and infrastructure while also saving millions of dollars by reducing costly damage from extreme weather. And as you mentioned um, just now in your question, as well as your open re opening remarks, adoption of the guidelines thus far is currently voluntary. Um, we are pleased that several agency that agencies have already started to incorporate components of the guidelines into their planning efforts. Um, some of these agencies, for example, um, include DEP, who incorporates um, guidelines related to sea level rise into their standard operating procedure across all capital projects. Um, HPD um, integrates guidelines into the guidelines into their green building framework, and DDC uses the guidelines uh, during their front end planning process. Um, but as you mentioned, the, um, this intro would uh, uh, kick off a pilot program um, that will be really important because this is really a new kind of capital planning for the city. Um, and it will give us a chance to um, really understand how uh, these guidelines apply to a variety of capital projects uh, that the city designs and constructs and, um, and also understand and understand the costs of, of those um, resiliency measures. Can you, thank you. Can you give us an idea of some insight into which agencies um, have been at the table when collaborating on, on design and construction guidelines like this? Uh, virtually every capital agency in the city government has been at the table um, in uh, developing the guidelines and um, refining them over the last several years. Um, so agencies like DDC, DEP, DOT, HPD, as well as authorities in the city government like um, SCA, NYCHA, um, EDC. And that was not a complete list, but it was just a, a, some examples of the agencies that have been involved. Um, has priority been given to um, for projects selected for the pilot, the pro uh, has priority been given to environmental justice communities? Um, well, we haven't piloted the guidelines yet. That's what would happen um, if this introduction. Is that, is that the idea? Um, I, I think that's a great idea. Um, we, it, that's something that we would be happy to discuss. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's obviously always been a huge issue for me. Um, you know. The, these are the folks who are on the front lines uh, of this fight. I mean, so we have to make sure that their communities are centered in whatever we do. Um, um, with with the release of the of the prelim, the preliminary budget, um, are you aware of any major capital funding changes to, to any of the current or new resiliency projects due to due to budget deficit? Um, none of the projects, capital projects that are currently applying the guidelines are being affected by uh, the current budget situation as far as we know. Okay, I mean, so they haven't, they haven't come to you and said to, to find savings anywhere in that or, or you're not aware of anything like that? Um, not the projects that are currently applying the guidelines, no. Okay. Um, do we have any, any new news for new resilient capital projects along the waterfront? Um, uh, news about new resilience capital projects along the waterfront. Um, no, I don't have anything to report right now. Okay, so as far as you know, everything that's already in the pipeline is, is secure, but there's nothing, we don't have anything new yet. Um, Right. I, again, um, in terms of um, projects that are applying the design guidelines, and, and I just want to maybe the one important distinction here that's it's 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 important to bring out, um, which is that 
Um, I want to be clear that the, the climate resiliency design guidelines um, do not currently apply to coastal protection projects. Um, and I just want to be um, clear about this. Coastal protection projects typically protect entire neighborhoods. And these projects are extremely technically complex and can cost hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, the, the climate resiliency design guidelines apply to individual buildings and pieces of infrastructure. So even though these um, uh, the guidelines, projects that the guidelines apply to and coastal protection projects operate at different scales. Both of these solutions are needed to increase resiliency. Um, and, and, you know, we, we want to make sure that we're advancing both of these types of solutions simultaneously um, in order to really meet our overall goal, goal of establishing multiple lines of defense for our communities. So what's the, what's the, and then I want to turn it over to, to Costa. What's the plan to engage the public uh, regarding the types of climate resilient capital projects in their communities. I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Sure. So how has or how will uh, MOR or other relevant city agencies engage the public uh, regarding the type of, of climate resilient projects to, to be built in their community? Um, around the climate resiliency design guidelines? Um, we'd be happy to talk to you about this. I, I think um, you know we're um, we're we're committed to communicating um, you know how how we're applying resiliency principles across a um, variety of projects and programs um, across the city, and uh, we would certainly appreciate your input on how best to communicate that uh, to communities. Okay, I mean, I just want to make sure that that we're engaging with you know the the EJ communities and not just sort of cooking this up in a boardroom somewhere. Um, and then and then rolling it out, and then the and then the EJ communities have to then say no, we don't like it. Um, I'd rather avoid that and, and have them at the table, to, you know, from from the get go. Absolutely, and I, and I believe the legislation actually requires engagement with with the public and um, uh, members of the public and experts, which we're of course committed to doing. Um, and it also requires that thirty percent um, of the pilots uh, are um, uh, implemented in, in environmental justice communities. Okay, Costa? Yeah, I'm here, brother. You got questions? Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. All right, uh, so Jamie, uh, first, always great to see you and, and it's, it's good to see you on Zoom and not on text, um, but thank you for all the great work that you're doing. Um, so just to be clear, uh, when we spend money on resiliency, uh, it's actually cheaper to kind of bake it into the cake, right? When we're doing these capital projects than it is to go back and retrofit later on, correct? Absolutely. Um, you know, our goal here is to build a culture of resiliency. We need to be considering resiliency ultimately in every city action and investment. And the climate resiliency guidelines are a really important tool to ensure that we're accounting for future climate threats in all of our capital investments. Um, it's certainly cheaper to uh, consider those uh, climate risks upfront um, in the design and in uh, construction of capital projects than to go back and retrofit later. So these guidelines, making them mandatory would actually save the city money in the long run, right? So we're not talking about imposing, this bill doesn't impose uh, undue costs on the city. It's actually gonna be something that's gonna save the city money over the next 10, or 15 years because they're not gonna to have to go back and uh, make them resilient later on, right? So this isn't a, a bill that's gonna add costs. You know, it may add a little bit of cost possibly in the upfront, but it's actually gonna save us money in the long run, which is what we should be thinking about having a limited budget, correct? That's absolutely right. And I think that during the pilot period, we will be able to better quantify some of those costs because we'll be able to apply the guidelines to a, a diversity of capital projects. Um, so it'll help us to really put some numbers to, 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 to that concept. Now, just to go off topic for a second, just how is MOR funded? Like how would, the, you know, have additional funding? How long are you going to be able to kind of keep running on what you're doing? Uh, but will, how long will you be able to continue to do this work as part of the, as this really important work that we need to get done for the city? Um, MOR is currently funded um, with uh, post Grandy, but post Sandy CDBG DR uh, federal grant dollars. 
So if that when those money if those monies were to run out, then we'd have to find funding for MOR elsewhere through the city budget. Is that is that what you're saying? Uh, that's right. Okay, that that is concerning. <laughs> that's very concerning. Um, yeah, um, we we need to do that. Uh, just quickly to go back to the bill to know I'm on a clock. Um, I just what sort of what sort of climate experts do you consult? What were their recommendations around these guidelines? I think there's a there's broad support for the guidelines. Um, you know, I I, it, I think um, uh, someone said it in their opening remarks, but this is quite common sense. And so, um, you know, we have been. Um, <laughs> Uh, we, we, we've, we've uh, I think, uh, received broad support from, from climate experts as well as the advocacy community about the idea of incorporating future climate risks and considering those future climate risks uh, in a science-based way across, um, across our capital portfolio. So it just makes sense to do this. Uh, you know, it's just, it's just common sense that you know, there's no one who's saying this is something we shouldn't be doing and it shouldn't be left up to individual agencies to pick and choose, right? In, in, in a, the 21st century, we shouldn't be leaving it up to whether someone decides to pull the guidelines out of, out of a book or not. It should be mandatory. It's really the way we should be going, right? Right, and, and the guidelines do offer some flexibility, right? Not every um, city infrastructure or buildings uh, project will um, encounter the same um, climate threats um, or impacts. And, um, you know, it, it depends on uh, the location that they're in and, and um, what exactly, what the type of uh, infrastructure project actually is. Um, and so the guidelines account for that um, and offer that flexibility. Um, you know, and I, I'm going to just turn it over to my colleague, Suzanne, um, to also speak about <clears throat> what we've been hearing from experts. Thanks, Janie. Um, I wanted to just add a little bit of flavor into the experts. So as Janie mentioned in her testimony, we have been developing these guidelines for um, a number of years. Um, we really wanted to ensure both that the design community and the scientific community were aligned. And so we've spent a lot of time uh, working with the MPCC, so the New York City Panel on Climate Change and other engineering and architectural experts to ensure that the information we're providing is understandable and adoptable at a very, um, like right off, right out of the gate. So that's been a great process. Um, I know that we have spoken with RPA and AIA and a number of um, groups that I believe will be uh, submitting testimony today. There's widespread understanding that we should not be utilizing um, historical weather data to build new infrastructure and facilities. And so adopting this forward-looking climate data is really critical. Yeah, sorry about that. I, I, I got muted. I muted myself by accident there, but. <laughs> no problem. Uh, that's that's uh, pretty 2020, 2021 these days. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but yes, uh, so I mean, this, I don't want to belabor the point, but it looks like these, uh, these guidelines make a lot of sense. Um, I think that I, I look forward to partnering with you on them. Uh, I'm going to pass it at this point back to uh, Chair Brennan, but I am very concerned about this MOR funding stream issue. And I think, you know, as we look at the city budget, we definitely gonna have to make sure that MOR is kept. Uh, this is, you know, we can't all, you know, in a 21st century city where, you know, we just dealt with, you know, usually I'm proud of my Greek heritage, but we just had, you know, Greek, you know, we had to go into the Greek alphabet for, for storms this past year, named storms this past year. Uh, that frightens me. Um, so to lose MOR would be a huge loss for the city. So I, I am absolutely concerned about losing that funding stream and how we move forward. So Chair Brennan, I, I pass it back to you and thank you for the time allotted to ask the questions. Yeah, Costa, right on. I share that concern. I mean, obviously we can't, I like to think that 2021, we've moved past the idea that, um, you know, focusing on climate change is some sort of thing, you know, as a luxury. I mean, it's, it's a, 
existential threat. It's, it needs to be prioritized. It's, um, I mean, obviously we'll help you in that fight, um, but it shouldn't be something that's in jeopardy. It needs to be, uh, it needs to be baseline really. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about intro 2198, um, Councilman Matteo's bill on the floodplains. Um, we've learned how important it is that structures that are located in the floodplain be elevated above uh, the base flood elevation to, to provide additional flood proofing. Uh, do you agree that additional uh, freeboard more than what the building code currently requires is necessary? Um, thanks for the question, uh, Chair Brannon. Um, in general, you know, we, we um, are supportive of uh, strengthening our building code to ensure that um, it is as resilient as possible. Um, with uh, Intro 2198, we just want to make sure that all resiliency standards um, for new construction utilize the best available science and reflect risk as accurately as possible. And um, in, in that vein, we just wanna make sure that, that the bill is coordinated with um, the climate resiliency design guidelines, the future flood maps, as well as the um, building co code update um, that is coming up um, that will include some updates to Appendix G. I mean, what other, what other options do property owners have to make their property safe from a flood event besides besides raising it? Um, there, there are a number of options that um, uh, property owners have to make their, their building safer. Um, uh, maybe I will pass it off to my colleague, um, Assistant Commissioner Ackroyd to um, uh, fill in some details here. Sure. Um, <clears throat> thank you for the opportunity to, to speak here, um, and uh, the department really does uh, share City Council's goal of making new buildings more resilient. Um, your question with regard to uh, what additional measures can, can um, property owners take to make buildings more resilient, um, there are, you know, um, retrofits to plumbing systems that could be helpful, so backflow prevention devices can help uh, to ensure that when the uh, city's sewer system is surcharged in a storm event that, uh, you know, subgrade spaces like basements don't become flooded. So this is a, a common sense uh, alteration that can assist. Um, also, I, I think um, getting additional uh, insurance to ensure that, that damages that uh, do occur um, can be addressed uh, financially um, is an important um, measure that is sometimes overlooked. Um, I think those are a, a, two, a few examples um, without, you know, a, a full scale uh, elevation. There's also um, converting spaces that are subject to flooding, um, you know, without, uh, that, are, that are below the base flood elevation, maybe converting them to um, parking or storage or or building access as opposed to um, using using them as habitable spaces. Um, so those are those are some possibilities. I mean, how how can we help homeowners who can't afford flood insurance? Um, you, you know, we have been um, working to um, advocate for reforms to the flood insurance program um, at the federal level so that they are um, really focused on a homeowner's ability to pay. One of the, um, one of the, the reforms that we have been advocating for for several years, and, and New York City is really a leader in this advocacy, um, is the use of means-tested vouchers. Me means Tested vouchers would um, set rates based on people's ability to pay um, uh, rather than um, just based on, on the maps themselves. Um, we think affordability must be a centerpiece of the, the flood insurance program, and, and that's why we've been um, uh, really leading uh, some of this advocacy at the federal level to, to um, make those changes to the flood insurance program. I mean, should we continue to build homes and businesses in areas that, that regularly flood now? 
You know, I, I think that um, uh, there are sort of two ways to think about it. Um, where you build matters, but also how you build matters. And so, um, you know, I think the how you build uh, question is really the, the focus of this hearing um, because we're talking about uh, design guidelines and, um, and this idea of um, implementing additional free board. So, you know, more stringent design standards, um, either through code or um, through a mandate of the guidelines will certainly help um, in a big way to ensure that the facilities that we are building in risky areas are um, as safe as possible. Yeah. What about building in areas that, that we project will flood regularly 10, 20, 50 years from now? What should we do? Um, we have... Um, uh, you, you know, I, th I think I'll, I'll answer this in two ways. Um, one is that um, in terms of uh, private construction in areas that are already um, experiencing regular tidal flooding, we have created a special zoning designation called special coastal risk districts, which limits density in those areas. Um, so we're acknowledging that, um, you know, th these, these areas are particularly risky um, and uh, rather than densifying any further, we wanna make sure that we're limiting density um, um, as, a, as a resiliency measure. Um, in the guidelines themselves, we've also created, um, we've also stipulated that um, those uh, uh, facilities or infrastructure that be, are being built in um, uh, uh, the highest percentile, um, uh, you know, the, the, the most risky areas um, are, uh, they, they should consider new locations um, be, because of their risk to regular tidal flooding. And I'm going to pass it off to my colleague Suzanne to add a bit more detail on that. Thanks, Janie. Yeah, as Janie mentioned, the guidelines uh, provide a detailed um, instructions on to how to do site analysis um, if you are going to be in the tidal floodplain, so the daily flood, you know, the daily floodplain um, over the useful life of the asset. A critical part of these guidelines is asking the design teams to look at how the climate changes over the whole time that that asset will be utilized. So as you said, you know, when we look at the, at the floodplain mid-century, uh, there will be places that have uh, tidal flooding. Um, some of those places, you know, we know uh, have issues of sunny day flooding today. And the guidelines stipulate that you need to look for alternative sites. Um, this is a great step and a, and a very good and responsible use of city capital dollars to ensure that we're not building in places that we know are going to be so risky in the future. How many, how many of the special flood hazard districts actually exist? Um, uh, I, I uh, don't have the number off the top of my head. I, I think it's about five. Um, I can get back to you with that number. Are they, are they in the, the neighborhoods that I would expect? Um, they're in places like um, Broad Channel, Howard Beach, um, Oakwood Beach, um, some of the lowest lying areas in the city. And how, what's the determination there? Like, why aren't there more? Why, why are there only that many? How do we get more? Do we need more? We'd be happy to follow up with you. DCP it actually leads the process of designating these special coastal risk districts. And um, we'd be happy to, to follow up with you so that DCP can, can okay, provide yeah. some of that background. Yeah, that's important. Um, okay. Uh, Council, I think I'm good. I don't know if I have, are there any other members that have questions? Uh, th thank you, Chair. I don't see any, but if there are any council members who would like to ask a question of the administration and have not done so, if you could use your Zoom raise hand function now. Okay, thank you. We will now turn to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we will be calling individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. Please begin once the sergeant has started the timer. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom and I will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. 
For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin upon setting the timer. Please wait for the Sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. I would now like to welcome our first panelist, Karen Imus of the Waterfront Alliance to testify. After Karen Imus, I will be calling on Jalissa Gilmore of the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance, and then Nicole Hernandez-Hammer of UPROSE. Karen Imus, you may begin once the sergeant has started the clock. Starting time. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Chair Brannon and council members. I'm pleased to be here today on behalf of Waterfront Alliance. My name is Karen Imus. I'm the Vice President of Programs. Uh, today's hearing touches on several important aspects of securing New York City's future in the face of climate change. First, we support the resolution calling on reinstatement of funding for finalization of the New York, New Jersey Harbor and Tributary Study, known as HATS. Waterfront Alliance through the Rise to Resilience Coalition successfully secured reforms to this study and potential funding for resilience projects through the Water Resources Development Act recently passed. The funding for HATS, however, remains uncertain as your resolution points out and Waterfront Alliance and the Rise to Resilience Coalition join you in calling on our congressional representatives as well as the Biden administration to ensure that the study is included in the Army Corps work and plan for this year. The completion of this study will bring jobs, coastal risk reduction, and nature's benefits to the metropolitan region at a time when a resilient recovery is needed more than ever. With respect to intro 2092, we enthusiastically support the efforts to codify the city's climate resiliency design guidelines, as well as intro 2198 to require that structures located in the floodplain be elevated an additional one to two feet. The city's guidelines are an effort to incorporate forward-looking climate change data in the design of all city capital projects. And we commend the Mayor's Office of Resiliency for the guidelines that were updated as recently as 2020. Piloting and codifying the city's climate design guidelines will make communities safer and save taxpayer dollars on a return of six to one. Simply put, building resilient means building better. Resiliency scoring is an important part of the bill and we are pleased to see efforts that create accountability and we would support a letter grades approach might much like the green buildings legislation. The waterfront edge design guidelines developed at Waterfront Alliance could work in tandem with the city's design guidelines as a way to score and verify projects that show not only resilience but also access ecology and innovation at the water's edge. Ultimately, we support mandating climate design guidelines for all development and redevelopment projects, public and private, in both the current and future 100 year floodplains. Such a mandate should entail regulatory, legislative and incentive based pathways for meeting resiliency standards. The codifying of guidelines for city projects is but one piece of a broader climate resilience legislative strategy needed. And to that end, we support a Rise to Resilience Act bill package that will include this bill, as well as legislation to create a suite of climate indicators, as well as a five borough coastal resilience plan. Finally, there is a tremendous opportunity for real institutional change through a much needed comprehensive climate planning and decision making framework across all city agencies, which impacts how the city designs, maintains, monitors, and replaces assets and infrastructures. And we hope that this is a subsequent step in the city's climate resilience strategy. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. I will now call on Jalissa Gilmore of the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance, who will be followed by Nicole Hernandez-Hammer of UPROSE, and then Paul Galay of Riverkeeper. Jalissa Gilmore, you may begin when the Sergeant announces time. Starting time. Good morning. Thank you, Chair Brandon and members of the City Council for the opportunity to testify. My name is Jaleesa Gilmore, and I'm the research analyst at the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance. Founded in 1991, NIJA is a nonprofit citywide membership network linking grassroots organizations from low income neighborhoods and communities of color in their fight for environmental justice. Massive investments are needed to ensure New York City communities are resilient to the impacts of future coastal storm risks 
but these investments must be made intentionally, centering equity and justice. The United States Army of Corps Corps of Engineers and YNJ Hats is an opportunity to protect New Yorkers against the risk posed by future storms. NUJA supports the resolution calling upon the United States Congress to restore funding to NYNJ Hats. However, as the project is revived, there needs to be a commitment to addressing concerns raised by the community prior to the suspension of the project. The majority of the options that the Army Corps presented heavily relied on large sea walls and gates to protect the shoreline. Instead, options that implement nature-based infrastructure and smaller scale flood protections, which can offer a number of environmental benefits should be considered. In this new phase, Army Corps should incorporate recommendations and community input from projects that have already been put forth by frontline communities yet not always considered or incorporated into final plans, such as the Hunts Point Resiliency and East Side Coastal Resiliency. Lastly, the environmental justice maps that the Army Corps is using does not accurately represent environmental justice neighborhoods. As the project moves forward, it should instead consider using the disadvantaged community screening tool currently being developed pursuant to the New York State Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. Again, building New York City neighborhoods to be resilient is critical to critical and NUJA supports intro 2092, which would develop climate resiliency guidelines and a climate resiliency score metric. We recognize the council's commitment to environmental justice with the requirement that 30% of the pilot projects be located in environmental justice communities. However, rather than require 30% of pilot projects in environmental justice areas, we recommend matching the New York State CLCPA's commitment of 35 to 40% for disadvantaged communities. Similarly to the Army Corps study, we are concerned that current maps may lead to an underinvestment in communities that need it most and should consider using the CLCPA's disadvantaged community screenings tool when it is available. And as the re resiliency score is developed, input from members of the public with expertise specifically in environmental justice should be consulted to ensure an equitable process. There has not been nearly enough coastal resiliency investment in the low income communities of color in the outer boroughs where the most vulnerable populations are. These building solutions have the opportunity to re remedy this and protect frontline communities. Thank you for the time to testify. Jalissa, you can keep going if you have more. No, that's good. I'll submit the full testimony. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to now call on Nicole Hernandez Hammer of Uprose, who will be followed by Paul Galay of Riverkeeper, to be followed by Daniel Gutman of the Metropolitan Storm Surge Working Group. Nicole Hernandez Hammer, you may begin when the sergeant calls time. Starting time. Good morning. Thank you to Chair Brandon and, and the council members for giving me the opportunity to submit my testimony today. My name is Nicole Hernandez Hammer. I am a biologist and I recently became the community environmental scientist for UPROSE. I've spent over a decade studying the impacts of flooding due to sea level rise and precipitation changes in frontline communities across the US. I am testifying today on behalf of UPROSE. Founded in 1966 and located in Sunset Park, Uprose is Brooklyn's oldest Latino community-based organization. We are intergenerational and Black Indigenous women of color led. We are working at the intersection of racial justice and climate change. Sunset Park is a frontline community of over 130,000 in Southwest Brooklyn that lives with many polluting infrastructures and a growing number of climate change impacts, including more intense storms and flooding. Our residents and small businesses were severely impacted by Superstorm Sandy and are disproportionately vulnerable to the storms we know will be coming as a result of climate change. Climate change poses significant risks to New York City, including more powerful storms, increased floods due to changes in precipitation, and nuisance flooding, also known as sunny day or blue sky flooding related to sea level rise. Adapting to impacts over time is essential, particularly in frontline communities like Sunset Park, as it is home to um, New York's largest significant maritime industrial area. We are currently working with our residents and small businesses to build greater resilience to these types of extreme weather events, which includes our work with auto shops to mitigate the dispersal of fugitive chemicals during storm events. 
UPRO supports additional free boards for capital projects. However, because there are discrepancies and limitations in the current sources that determine the designation of floodplains, we urge you to use the most recent sea level rise projections and storm surge studies for 2080 and 2100, such as those in the IPCC, the National Climate Assessment and the um, NYPCC reports and their for forthcoming updates. As these policies move forward, we ask that you continue your commitment to frontline communities by assuring that the implementation of this work will be conducted in close partnership with environmental justice partners. Another project that is critical in developing a more accurate understanding of flooding scenarios is the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, New York and New Jersey Harbor and Tributaries Focus Area Feasibility Study, HATS. Using more accurate and current flooding information will create more robust resilience for capital projects that have useful lives measured in decades. Therefore, UPRO supports the continuation of the funding of the HATS project in solidarity with our EJ partners. We recommend that the environmental justice related components of the study be made more significant significant and specified in a separate report that should be developed in meaningful partnership with frontline communities, a partnership that has been lacking substance in this work to date. There needs to be an effort to move away from a focus on hard infrastructure solutions to more holistic adaptation measures, such as living shorelines. And these solutions must be developed. I'm expired. Oh, okay, thank you very much. I will submit the rest of my testimony in writing. Nicole, you can finish, please. Thank you. I'll go ahead and finish this part yeah. and then I'll submit yeah, the rest. Make sure you send it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so as I was saying, um, there needs to be more of an effort uh, to move away from a focus on hard infrastructure solutions to more holistic adapt adaptation measure measures such as living shorelines. And these solutions need to be developed in partnership with frontline communities, those that are most vulnerable to climate change and that have often been not, not been a priority in um, these types of research initiatives. Additionally, the community-based participatory research model should be a key component of these efforts going forward. This will allow for more connectivity between assessment, development of recommendations, and easier dissemination of findings to the most vulnerable communities. And I'll go ahead and stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. We will now call on Paul Gallet of Riverkeeper to testify, who will be followed by Daniel Gutman of the Metropolitan Storm Surge Working Group, to be followed by Catherine McVeigh Hughes, the Financial District Neighborhood Association. Paul Gallet, you may begin when the sergeant calls time. Starting time. Thank you, council. Thank you, council members, Brennan, Rose, Diaz, Konstantinidis, and Ulrich. Thank you to Director Pavishi and her colleagues for their testimony. Thank you to all of the staff members who uh, have helped prepare this hearing. Uh, and of course, uh, thanks to Karen Imus, Nicole Hernandez, Hermar, and um, Jalisha Gilmore, um, our partners in Rise to Resilience, UPROSE, and New York City Environmental Justice Alliance. Uh, on behalf of Riverkeeper, I've submitted written testimony and in the hopes that I might keep to three minutes and appreciate uh, the ability to go slightly longer if necessary, I'll not read anything from my testimony, but I will, I will say that uh, we are looking at an extraordinarily uh, enormous challenge. Uh, if you look at the New York City Climate Resiliency Guidelines, Design Guidelines, even the middle range scenario for 20, the 50s is 11 at 21 inches of sea level rise. And by the 2080s, 18 to 39 inches. Most people think that you should rely on the 90% scenario because you wanna make sure that you are planning for such uh, scenarios above the mid range. Uh, then you'd be talking about 30 inches and 58 inches. Thank goodness that in addition to this growing challenge, we have a new opportunity <clears throat> speaking to first to Resolution 1389, when you look at what has just been done by this new uh, law enacted at the federal level on December 27th, Water Resources Development Act of 2020, it's extraordinary the change that this will help bring about if we work together. 
if we make the most of this, if of course Congress first funds the study, it had been funded at roughly $20 million before the president put paid to it uh, back in February uh, 2020. And it's my pleasure to say the former president, I should have said. Uh, but fully implementing it is going to require an extraordinarily higher level of partnership between the federal government and the state of New Jersey, the city of New York and the state of New York. You are involved partners in this study and I suggest that you press at every level, whether the administration or the council on the Army Corps to make the most of the study. The Army Corps um, motto is essayon, which loosely translates as let us try. I think the Army Corps is welcoming this opportunity to make the most of what this new law allows. And to be specific, uh, the new law requires greater community consultation at every level, particularly with communities of color, tribes, and low income communities. It provides, for, it provides for, may, may I continue for another minute? Yes, of course, go ahead, sorry. Oh, th thank you, no problem. It provides for um, up to 10 demonstration areas for uh, low-income communities and communities of colors and tribes for doing a better job of collaboration. New guidelines requiring future projects such as this to maximize sustainable development, protect and restore the functions of natural systems and affordably address the needs of economically disadvantaged communities. We are in an era to start to wrap up where uh, many businesses are talking about something they call stakeholder capitalism, which is going to give more consideration to customers, to societies, to employees, to the environment, not just to, stake, to shareholders. We have to enter the era of stakeholder coastal resilience planning. We can no longer plan from the top down. We can no longer plan as before WERDA 2020 was enacted based on laws dating from 1955 that didn't foreground sea level rise and stationary storm systems. The era of planning for enormous storm barriers has got to be at an end. They don't support protection from sea level rise. Let's make the most of this bill. A final word about development tying to to the um, intro that pertains to development. Uh, it makes no sense to be thinking about additional coastal development until we have not just coastal design standards, but also coastal protection plans for the entirety of the five boroughs of the city of New York. Thank you for the time and, and for allowing me to go over slightly. Thank you. We will now call on Daniel Gutman of the Metropolitan Storm Surge Working Group, followed by Catherine McVeigh Hughes of the Financial District Neighborhood Association. Daniel Gutman, you may begin when the sergeant calls time. Starting time. Uh, hi, my name is Daniel Gutman. I'm representing the uh, Metropolitan Storm Surge Working Group. Uh, and we're, uh, and I thanks for the opportunity to testify. We're supporting, we're very supportive of the resolution 1389 about the uh, HAT study. Uh, and we hope you adopt it, but we do have one suggestion. And the fourth whereas clause, uh, you state that the HAT study, if completed, would have proposed a comprehensive plan for managing future potential coastal storm risks. But that statement actually isn't quite accurate. Uh, several of the alternatives in the HAT study were not comprehensive. In particular, uh, the alternatives 3B and 4, which included uh, and were based on uh, New York City's uh, storm uh, surge uh, coastal protection, uh, that, that, that's the core of alternative three, B and four, but 40% of New York City's plan, 40% uh, of the elements in, in the, for storm surge protection were left out 
of the core study. And, uh, and uh, on the other hand, we agree with you that the, uh, the, uh, the core study, the, the alternatives that they study should be comprehensive. And so we suggest that you modify that whereas clause to say that the, uh, the uh, alternative should be uh, comprehensive and then add a paragraph at the end to request that the New York State DEC, which is the uh, state partner, ensure that the entire New York City, uh, you know, this is the one NYC plan, the one that Janie Bashevi was testifying about, that the entire, uh, all the elements for uh, a storm surge protection in the New York City plan be included in the core alternatives. Thank, thank you. you. Sorry, Chair Brennan. No, thank you, Daniel. I, I also want to acknowledge that uh, we've been joined by Councilman Eric Ulrich. Sorry. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Gutman. We will now call on Catherine McVeigh Hughes of the Financial District Neighborhood Association to testify. You may begin when the sergeant calls time. Starting time. Let me unmute. Hi. Um, good morning. Um, Chair Brennan and members Constantinides Diaz, Rosen Ulrich, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Catherine McVeigh Hughes. I served 20 years on Manhattan Community Board One, half of that time as chair or vice chair. Today I'm representing the Financial District Neighborhood Association, known as FDNA. FIDI is home to roughly 60,000 residents and is the fourth largest business district in the country. FDNA is the grassroots organization representing those of us who live in Manhattan, south of City Hall. FDA, FDNA supports resolution 1389-2020 that calls upon the United States Congress to restore funding to the US Army Corps of Engineers, New York, New Jersey Harbor and Tributaries, USAC HATS Focus Area Feasibility Study. And the states of New York and New Jersey to advance their shares of the next phase of funding to revive the study until it is fully restored by the Congress. As you know, the study was suspended by order of then President Trump in January 2020 with his quote, mops and buckets, unquote, tweet. The study included an area of 2,150 square miles and 900 plus miles of affected shoreline with an affected population of 16 million people in both New York and New Jersey. His executive action means that there's no planning at all underway to address the threats of sea level rise and storm surge for the entirety of the nation's largest metropolitan area. You should also know that the HAT study, however, includes alternatives that do not protect the entirety of New York City's 520 mile shoreline. For example, 40% of New York City's plan for local shoreline protection was omitted from the study. Since the city would have to pay for that 40%, omitting the city's expenditure from the hats skewed the cost comparison with comprehensive regional approaches. FDNA urges the city council to include language in the resolution to highlight the importance of the comprehensive region-wide approach and rejecting alternatives that leave significant areas of New York City exposed. Furthermore, FDNA supports resolution T-2021-774 calling on Congress to pass the president to sign legislation amending the Stafford Act to proactively fund the planning and construction of FEMA and HUD coastal resiliency projects. The resolution states, quote, regular tidal flooding is already occurring in New York City neighborhoods such as Broad Channel, Hamilton Beach, and Howard Beach, with a lower Manhattan climate resiliency study conducted by New York City's Economic Development Corporation, the Mayor's Office of Recovery and Resiliency, finding that by 2050, 37% of buildings in lower Manhattan will be I'm expired with a rise in sea level rise um, caused by a storm, otherwise known as storm surge. If I could just speak for um, one more minute, it would be great. Moving from the federal to the city level, only recently has the planning process for the 
financial district and seaport been restarted. The Fidine Seaport Climate Resiliency Plan is expected to be completed by the end of this year and has no funding for implementation. The plan states that by 2100, 100 year storm is projected to cause flooding over 12 feet deep above ground level in parts of the financial district and seaport. You can continue reading my uh, testimony um, that I've submitted, but just for the record, south of Wall Street is unprotected and it took three days for the interim flood protection plan to be implemented this summer in August. I would also like to acknowledge the exponential growing cost of climate change to our country and the cost of each extreme disaster event. Also attached, I have submitted Surge Watch Newsletter 12, 11, and 10 for the record. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you very much for your testimony. If we have inadvertently missed anyone that has registered to testify today and has yet to have been called, please use the Zoom hand function and you will be called in the order that your hand has been raised. Seeing none, I will now turn it over to Chair Brannon for closing remarks. Chair Brannon. Thank you, Council. Uh, thank you, everyone, for testifying. Um, these, these hearings are always important for me because I get to learn from the folks who know this stuff much better than I do. Um, you know, I think if there's one thing, my biggest takeaway from uh, today's hearing is the concern that I understand we're heading into continued or sustained uncharted water, um, pun, pun possibly intended, as far as the budget is concerned. Um, we need to make sure, we shouldn't have to fight to make sure that uh, funding and, and the prioritization of um, issues and, and action surrounding climate change is somehow seen as um, you know, a luxury or something that we can only focus on when the city is awash with cash. Um, these, this needs to be an issue that remains centered um, and remains to be a top priority uh, no matter what. And I understand we're gonna have to be triaging quite a bit over the next couple of years before we fully dig out of this hole, uh, but we really have to make sure and we have to impress upon the current administration, the next administration, um, to ensure that, that action around uh, climate change and environmental justice remains a top priority. It's concerning um, that we even have to worry about that, frankly. So uh, these bills today are very important and I look forward to seeing them through to passage. Um, and I thank everyone uh, for your input in today's hearing and, and being with us today. And I um, hope everyone has a great week. And with that, I will adjourn this hearing. Thank you.